Welcome back to part two of why and how to master desktop sharing examiner interviews. At the end of part one, we left you with a view of examiner training materials so that you would know what examiners expect when you come to an interview. In part two, we cover the philosophy and mechanics of getting ready for an examiner interview. First, you get ready and then go sharing. There's a lot of thinking that goes into getting ready for an interview. It's not something that you can do in 30 minutes just before the interview starts. The first thing is a general thought exercise that's necessary to put you in the right frame of mind for all of your interviews. It's thinking about what makes it difficult for us and examiners to be on the same page, for us and examiners to communicate, for us and examiners to agree on claim wording. T three things that get in the way are time pressure, badly written applications and claims, and the broadest reasonable interpretation rule. Both applicants and examiners face time pressure. On the applicant side, Things could be polished once or twice more if we had more time, but budgets often don't allow that. On the examiner side, productivity is essential. We sometimes find that the longest, most carefully written and best explained specifications go unread because there simply isn't time for an examiner to meet their productivity quotient if they read the entire application. Finally, there's the broadest reasonable interpretation rule that hasn't been fairly well explained by the Board of Patent Appeals, hasn't been very well explained in the MPEP, and for which I've never seen any particular training materials out of the PTO. These are all problems and issues that we face in virtually every interview we go to. For a particular interview, at least if you have an office action already, I like to pigeonhole what's going on in the office action that creates a difference of opinion between me and the examiner. Here are some examples of ways that I think about what's going on. If I have a notion of why the examiner and I are different at a level other than just point-by-point -point discussion, makes it much easier for me to figure out a lesson plan for the interview. The point here is that you should approach every interview as a teaching experience, not an argument, but a teaching. And every teaching needs a lesson plan. I love knowing as much as I can about my audience, about the particular examiner, the examiner and their speed as I possibly can before the interview starts. I actually go to Lexis and plug the examiner's name in. I find out how many cases they've allowed, whether they've allowed cases recently or whether there's been a period of time that they allowed no cases. I figure out how many years they've been examining. I think about whether they seem to be ahead of track or behind track in terms of the level of authority they've received. I try to know my audience before the interview starts. Then I call and invite the examiner. Inviting the examiner presents two distinct problems. If you already have an office in action in hand, it's relatively easy. You call the examiner, tell them basically what you're going to go over during the interview, Tell them that you want to use desktop sharing and that the, that's approved and that you'll send an invitation along. You find out when an interview will be convenient for the examiner and it can be at your mutual convenience. After all, you already have the office action in hand. You follow up your scheduling phone call with an email that describes what's going to go on during desktop sharing give them the names of some people that they can double check with if they want to verify that desktop sharing is okay with the PTO. And you're ready to go. One thing that I do when I set up the interviews 
is that I try to orient the examiner towards the issues that I'm going to be presenting in the interview. I basically tell the examiner what my lesson plan is. What gives rise to a difference of opinion between the examiner and myself, at least in my opinion. The second kind of invitation is a little bit trickier. That's where you don't yet have a first office action. If you're in an accelerated exam program or the first action interview pilot, the examiner will contact you. That's pretty easy. If you're not, the timing is a lot trickier. The key to timing, if you're trying to arrange a f an interview before the first action without being part of one of the formal programs, is to find a way to talk to the examiner between the time that they've done their preliminary search and when they write their office action. That's a one-week window. We raised the question with Commissioner Stahl when he was out here in San Francisco a few weeks ago as to how you might do that. And he said there's no way that they can predict when an examiner will actually take up the application for examination. But he said, why not put an interview request in the file that says you want an interview before the first office action? And even better, a couple of weeks later, in the electronic filing system, that we all use, a new description appeared for an interview request before a first office action. So now instead of having to go through the mechanics that are described in my paper, you can simply put in a request using the right description and the examiner will know that you're one of those people who's interested in doing an interview and trying to get a first action allowance. Since the first action allowance rates all the way across the board are up to 15 percent and they're up to 45 percent in the officially sanctioned programs, you'll find that examiners, especially young examiners, are happy to work with you to try and increase their productivity by working out either an understanding of the case or an agreed amendment that leads to a first action allowance. That's getting ready. Now we go sharing. In this segment of the talk I'm going to go through some things and show you what I do to get ready for a desktop sharing interview. Don't try to understand the structures behind it. Just watch and see what the functional description I'm giving you is. In the paper and by studying these slides afterwards you can figure out just how it's done, but that would be kind of difficult to do at the rate that I'm going to go through this. There are four parts to arranging your documents before a desktop sharing interview actually takes place. There's a ritual that I have for how I annotate the office actions that come in and the references so I can see exactly what the examiner is relying on in order to keep those things straight I put titles into the document file properties so that the documents will have sensible names instead of eight digit numbers. I put in bookmarks in the order that I want to uh, go through things. This list of bookmarks gives you a preview of the interview demonstration that we're going to do in a couple of minutes. During the demonstration I'll go through figure two figure 4, then back to figure 1a. I may actually take the examiner to the definition of a single action. Um, this is the the Amazon one-click pattern that we're using for the demonstration. On the last page you saw a green box around the word figure 4. This shows how you set up that green box. When you annotate a crosslink you create a way of navigating directly from the text to the figures or from the figures back to the text. This is an example of making it so that I can go from the text that describes figure 4 to the actual figure 4. These crosslinks are very helpful in moving around during an interview, avoiding any cumbersome navigation. 
Once I have all the annotations, bookmarks, links that I want, about 15 or 20 minutes before the interview, I load up the documents that I'm going to use during desktop sharing. I always start with a Word document that includes the text of the claims to go over and amend. I set change tracking on so that any typing I do during the interview will be immediately visible to the examiner. I load a series of PDF documents, always the specification and figures because that's what I'm going to talk from. I load the office action and any references that the examiner has cited and I load any supplemental documents that might be of interest during the interview. I always preload everything that might possibly be used during the interview to avoid any fumbling. Then I start the interview session. When the examiner comes to their screen this is what they see. They can type any name they want. When they enter the room they begin seeing my screen I make sure that they've got their screen set to full screen mode. In the standard mode, what you see on my screen is framed with a number of pods or boxes around the edges, and only part of the examiner's screen is used. So what you want to do is make sure that the examiner has set it so that what's on your screen fills their screen. Thank you very much for joining us for this presentation. I hope you've enjoyed it. The materials used in this presentation are available on our website, www.hmbay.com, like halfmoonbay.com. There are samples there of emails and other documents that you might want to use to set up an examiner interview.